I'm excited about this week talking about how it's time to take action in your life. We're also excited, of course, next week we're starting At The Movies. If you've never been to an At The Movies here, you are in for a treat. It is an amazing series we do every year where we take movies and combine teaching with them. It's an incredible thing. I mean, come on, can you go wrong with Jesus and popcorn? Really? I mean, come on. It's awesome. You don't want to miss At The Movies starting next week. It's going to be awesome. Every single uh, atrium with all of our campuses have themes to them as well. It's a lot of fun. And so again, you don't want to miss this series. And so it's a lot of fun. Bring your kids and bring your neighbor's kids. They will love it. I promise you it's a really great thing. So I want to dive right in. I'm excited to talk today about how there is a time to take action. And I believe that time is now. At the end of this message, I'm going to challenge you to do two things. We're going to do one thing corporately together as a church. We're all going to commit to bringing someone next week. But I also want to challenge you personally to do something new and your life starting this week. And so don't miss this, this action point at the very end. It all leads up to that. Very, very excited about this. And here's why this matters, because there is a moment when your life can change. One moment can change everything for you. I truly believe that. In fact, look what the scripture says about this. It says in Ecclesiastes 3, it says, there is an opportune time to do things. There is a moment that is time to take action. And I believe that time for you is today. I believe this is an opportunity for you. So let's dive right in. I'm excited about today's message. You guys ready to go? Because I'm fired up. All right, let's go. Here we go. So scripture is pretty clear about this. Number one, God always calls us to take what he gives us and multiply it. He wants us to be multipliers. He says this in John 15, I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. God says, if you will be busy doing my work and, and going for fruit, that means what? That means getting results in your life. He says, if you'll do that, there's nothing you can't ask that I won't give you. Think about that. God says, if you'll be about my business, there's nothing you can say. You, God, I need this. God, I need that. God's like, the answer is always yes, if you're doing it for me. And so that's how God works. He says, I want you to bear fruit. Fruit just means I want you to get results with your life. Look what it says in Genesis chapter one. When God starts the whole earth up, what's the first thing he tells Adam and Eve? He says this, he says, be fruitful and multiply. So now, yes, he wants them to multiply by having children, of course, that's part of it as well. But he also wants us to multiply every area of our life. And you may say, Pastor, that sounds great, but you know, I've kind of blown it my life. I'm kind of in the later stages of life. I've kind of had some mess ups. And so I think that's maybe for someone kind of starting off. Oh, no, no, no. If, if that's what you think, let me show you Genesis chapter nine. This is after the whole world, they blew it. This is after it was got so bad, God said, I'm starting over. And so he floods the entire world. And the only ones left after the flood are Noah and his boys and their wives. And what is the first thing God tells Noah and all his family? He says, what? Be fruitful and multiply. So whether you are starting or restarting, God is not through with you. It's time to multiply. He wants you to do that. He's very clear in scripture. Genesis tells us that in Genesis chapter nine, verse seven, be fruitful, multiply, increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. And so you may say, well, I don't know where to start. We'll start from where you are. Uh, my friend Rick Warren puts it this way. Do what you can with what you have where you are. Do what you can with what you have where you may say, I don't have much. Well, then it should be easy to double it if you don't have much, right? I'm just starting with a little, then multiply that, then multiply that, then multiply that, and start with where you are and simply multiply, and God can do great things through you if you are willing to do that. Now, to do that, this is really important. You're gonna have to lay aside your excuses. And boy, we all have excuses, don't we? We all have reasons why we can't succeed, reasons why we can't lose weight, reasons why we can't get rich, reasons why we can't prom get promoted, reasons why we can't get married, reasons why we can't have children, reasons why we can't do whatever God tells us, reasons why we can't come to church, reasons why we can't get close to God. We all have reasons, don't we? We all have excuses. But look what it says in Proverbs 26. It says, don't be lazy and keep saying there's a lion outside. Let me let you in on something. Somewhere in the world, there's a lion outside. So if you're looking for a reason to stay inside, there it is. Well, I can't go out because Pastor Bill said somewhere out there, there's a lion. So I can't leave my house. And so if you are scared to take a risk, then the, the riskiest thing you could ever do in your life is to quit taking risks. So I want to challenge you to quit giving yourself excuses. We always have a reason why we can't do something. But it says in James 2, faith that does nothing is dead. Another translation says faith without works is dead. In other words, God wants you to have faith and then do something with your faith. You know, ambition is not enough, by the way. 
You can be super ambitious. Oh, I, I want to change the world. I want to make a lot of money. I want to, you know, take over this industry. I want to, whatever you want to do. That's great that you want to, want to, want to, but what are you doing? And so you got to do something. And so faith without works is dead. We're supposed to do something. I love that there's this guy named Bernard Roth. He's the head of the D school at Stanford University. The D school stands for the design school. They teach you how to design your life, design products, that kind of thing. So it's a very successful, well-known program. But I love one thing he teaches all of his students. He says, we are really good at making excuses. Maybe you're always late and you walk in late and you say, oh, I'm really sorry I'm running late. Traffic was bad or I got caught up at the office or whatever your excuses is. But he teaches them, whatever your excuses are, list out your excuses for not having what you want, not doing what you want to do. Whatever your excuses are, write them down. And then he says, say this out loud. After you say your excuses, then say this out loud. Say, that's a good reason. I love that, right? He's, he says, make, make it as sarcastic as you can. Like whatever your reason is, oh, I've been just too busy to get back to church. Oh, that's a good reason. Oh, I just haven't got a chance to get back in the word of God because I got so much going on. Oh, that's a good reason. Turn to the person next to you. You gotta do the stupid face when you do it too, right? Turn to the next to you and say, that's a good reason. Oh, come on, you can do better than that. Turn to the next round right now say, that's a good reason. Oh, now you're getting it, right? Because what it does is it just makes your reasons look dumb, doesn't it? You realize like all my reasons don't really make any sense. We always have a reason for stuff, don't we? Even in church world, we do. Did you know that right now there's this, there's a thing going on called the Great Resignation? People are quitting their jobs like crazy, right? Because the economy's bad, and you know everyone's saying it's going to go into recession and all you know all the world problems and all the division we have in our country. I mean, all that stuff going on. So people always have excuses. So you know what? Forget this. I'm just going to quit. And so do you know what also is happening is pastors are quitting in, in droves. It's, it's the highest percentage of pastors quitting in, in decades. And so because they're discouraged. And you know why? Because people are making all these new claims. Oh, the church is over. It's never coming back. It's not going to be what it was. That's ridiculous. You know what it says in Matthew chapter 6? Jesus said this. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He said, I'm not done. But we have excuses for why we're not coming to church. We have excuses for why, not, why we're not getting involved. We have excuses for why we're not going to tithe. We have all kinds of excuses. But you know what's happening right now this morning? People are gathered in church worshiping right now in Ukraine, which means you and I don't have an excuse. So I just want to challenge you, quit giving yourself excuses. You can either have success or your excuses, but you can't have both. So you can hold on to your excuses all you want, but if you do that, you can't have the success that God has for you. If you let go of your excuses, then you can have what the thing is that you've always wanted. But you have to let go of your excuses. We are good at excusing ourselves from all kinds of things. Oh, I'm just too old. Well, that's a good reason. I'm too young. That's a good reason. I'm not educated enough. That's a good reason. I don't have the money. That's a good reason. We have all kinds of reasons, don't we? I want to challenge you, let go of those and say, no, God, you told me that I can do this and you're a God who comes through. You're a God of the impossible, which means I can do what you've called me to do. So just go do it. Don't hold back. Quit, quit holding on your excuses and do what God told you to do. Speaking of multiplying, I want to show you something. There's a lot of debate going on in our world today about what to do with, with you know, uh, children who, who don't have a home or un, unborn, unwanted children. What do you do about that? Check out what this family's doing. Check this video out. My name is Alyssa McCarter and this is my husband, Dalen, and we have four children and we are starting our journey to become foster parents in a foster family. So I've always known that I want to foster children and I think God just continues to remind me that I've been called for something bigger than myself. If it's meant for you, you know, God is going to place it upon your heart. It's funny how things happen. You start listening and paying attention to what the Lord wants, and it's just, it's thrown in your lap, and it's it's right there. And it, it, it feels amazing when you actually uh, open your ears and listen to what He wants you to do. These kids need attachment. They need to know what that is because they don't know what that is or they don't know what a healthy attachment is. So one of the biggest things that I am praying for is that we have an impact on these children, that they just take away from our family that there is love. There's a love that's bigger than even us and bringing them to church with us and showing them that there is a world of people out there who want to see that they grow. And for our kids to understand what we're doing for these children that are in need of, you know, a home or our love or, you know, bringing them to church. 
you know, this, the support, it doesn't, for these kids, it's not only behind us, you know, the church ever since, you know, we started serving a month ago. Yeah. It's just so reassuring to talk to people and they pour into you and, you know, yeah. it's just, it makes you feel like you're doing, you know, what God has called you to do. So I think if anybody is wanting to foster and they're not sure, just say yes. Like, just say yes, even if it's just to looking into it. Just say yes. Isn't that great? For all the debate going on in our society right now about what to do with an unwanted child, the question's wrong. There's no such thing as an unwanted child. And so somebody wants that child, and that's the beauty of foster and adoption. And don't tell me a lecture on that because we have adopted. And I'm so thankful that the mother of my daughter uh, made sure that she had that child. And guess what? We wanted her and she's blessed our life. And I want to encourage you in the same way. The church has an answer. It's called adoption and foster. Isn't that a beautiful thing? There is an answer to this question. I just want to encourage you to open your heart to that. Maybe if that's something God has for you, maybe that's not what God's telling you to do, but I want to tell you this. God wants you to multiply. You know, for this family to multiply their family, they already have four of their own kids and yet they're going to take on more children. What a blessing that is. Maybe if you're just not multiplying that, maybe it's multiplying your resources. Maybe it's multiplying your opportunity. I don't know what God's telling you to do, but maybe for you, multiply means it's time to expand your business. It's time to expand uh, and start a business. Maybe it's time to go back to school. I don't know what God's telling you, but I believe God's speaking to someone today to set aside your excuses and do what the Lord is telling you to do. I want to challenge you right now. What's God stirring in your heart? What have you been listening to excuses rather than doing what God told you to do. It's time to take action on what the Lord put in your heart. It says in 2 Corinthians 1, for as many as are the promises of God, in him they are yes. Therefore also through him is our amen. Amen, by the way, means let it be. That's basically saying, God, yes, let it be. For the glory of God through us. And so I just want to challenge you that we serve a God of yes. So quit giving yourself a no and start to embrace God's yes for your life, that he has big things for you to do. God is not through working through you. Amen. He's not through doing things in and through your life. He is not. Now I wanna challenge you with this next one. Not only do we need to lay aside our excuses, but we also need to pray. We need to call out to God for what it is that he is stirring in us to do. And so what I mean by prayer is stand in the gap. There's this concept in Ezekiel. It says, I searched for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand in the gap before me for the, land, for the land so that I would not destroy it, but I found no one. He was saying, who will stand in the gap? And we see the same concept in Psalm 106. For fed up, God decided to get rid of them. And except for Moses, his chosen, he would have. But Moses stood in the gap and, def and deflected God's anger, prevented it from destroying them utterly. So there's this concept in the Bible called standing in the gap. Basically, th there was walls around cities. And wherever there was a hole in the wall, they would have to send a soldier or soldiers to go stand in that gap. It looks something like this. And so let me show you a wall here that has a hole in it. And so... What God tells us to do is where is there a gap in your life? Go stand in the gap and say, God, I'll call out to you to fill this gap, to fill this void in my life. And I believe that you will do that. Does anyone have a gap in their life? They need someone to they need God to fill it. God will make up the financial gap. He will make up the emotional gap, the relational gap, whatever you're missing. Go stand in that gap. Say, I stand in the middle of this need and I call on you, God, to fill in this hole in my life. Now I wanna challenge you not only to stand in the gap for your needs, but stand in the gap for someone that you love. And so right now, here's my challenge for you. Is there someone in your family that's not honoring God? That's not walking with God right now, that's hurting. Maybe God wants you to stand in the gap and pray for them. And so I wanna challenge you right now, of all of our churches, if God puts someone on your heart, a family member, a friend, a neighbor, a coworker, someone you love dearly, that you know they're making bad decisions or, or they're just lost or hurting right now, would you stand and pray with me right now? If you feel called by God, if God puts someone specific on your heart, stand for them. Stand in their name right now and let's pray for them. Would you just do that across all of our churches, those watching online, just stand your feet. Say, I'm, I'm standing in the gap for my son, for my daughter. I'm I'm standing in the gap for my marriage. I'm standing in the gap for my nephew. I'm standing in the gap for my mother, my father, my sister, my brother. Who are you standing in the gap for right now? Let's pray. There's, a, there's a, something that happens right now in, in, um, in churches in Korea. 
uh, th there's this great movement and the largest churches in the world are in Korea. I don't know if you knew that or not, but uh, they have churches that have 500,000 people at one church. It's, it's incredible. And so God moves powerfully. But when they, when they pray, when we pray here in America, one person prays and we all agree with that. But when they pray, they all pray out loud together. So right now we're going to pray for the one that we are standing in the gap for. And so right now, just pray it out loud who you're praying for. Let's go. You ready? Let's pray for who we are standing there for. Go ahead. Say it out loud. God, I pray for my friend right now. Lord, I pray you bless them. I stand in the gap for them right now. Just say their name out loud right now across all of our campuses. Just pray it out loud. God, I pray for my child. Lord, I pray for my boss. I pray for my best friend. Just say it out loud. Who are you praying for? Stand in the gap for them. Do you love them? Do you care for them? Then stand in the gap and pray for them. Say, I'm not going to let this hole in the wall, let the enemy come in in their life. I'm going to stand in that gap. I refuse to let them take that hit. Just like a good soldier would stand in the gap in the wall to protect the city. We're standing in the gap of their life to protect them. Call out to your God to help them come back to him. Pray for them right now, sincerely, earnestly. God, I pray for them. I pray they would return to you. I pray you'd protect them. Protect them from bad decisions. Protect them from depression. Protect them from addiction. Protect them from the wrong decisions, the wrong relationships. God, I pray you'd guard them, protect them, and help them come back to you. Thank you, God, that we can call out to you and we know that you hear our prayers when we pray. Thank you, God, that we can stand in the gap for our loved one right now. Lord, we love you. Thank you, God, as a church that we stand in the gap for those in need. Lord, in our society, while people are busy fighting, we're gonna stand in the gap for our country. We're gonna stand in the gap for our society and ask, Lord, that you would have your will done in this country. You would have your will done in our lives. Lord, thank you, God, that you are the answer that we all need. It's in you that we are complete. And so we stand in the gap right now for our country, for our, those we love for those in need. And thank you, Lord, that we stand in our own gap. And we thank you, Lord, that you will fulfill the holes in our lives. In your name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Isn't God good? Isn't he good? Praise God. Thank you. You can be seated. So we want to pray and we want to stand in the gap for our loved ones, for those that we are praying and asking God to do something in their life. And keep praying for them. Don't stop just today. Keep praying for them and that God would do something great in their life, in their midst. And so, and then here's another thing I want to challenge you to do. Number four, overcome resistance with strategy. Overcome resistance. Where is the resistance in your own life? Maybe you say, man, I have all kinds of excuses, right? We kind of blew that out of water, right? That's a good reason, right? So we kind of blew that out of water, but, but we still kind of hang on to those. And so one of the ways to overcome resistance in your life is through good strategy. Maybe, maybe you say, man, I really have a hard time getting up in the morning and going to the gym. Why don't you call a friend to meet you at the gym at a certain hour? Now the resistance is overcome because you have someone waiting on you, right? Maybe you have a hard time getting to church. You're like, man, I know I watch online, but I really want to get back physically into church. If, you, if you're anywhere near us, we'd love for you to do that. If you can't, you're online, that, that's church too. We understand that. But maybe if you're having a hard time getting back physically to church, why don't you commit to serving at one of the campuses? Because then you have to show up because someone's counting on you. And so what does that mean? Your strategy is going to overcome your resistance, right? Maybe if you're trying to eat healthy, you know, well, best thing you can do is go through your house and get rid of all the junk food. And it's easier to overcome the resistance of, of, of trying not to eat all that stuff. If it's just not there, right? And so a good strategy is better than trying to overcome resistance. So I want to challenge you to do this. Like Luke, scripture says, Colossians 4 says, make the most of every chance you have to tell others the good news. Be wise in all your contacts with them. How many of you guys have a friend who you've invited to church that is very resistant? Anybody have someone like that? Maybe a friend or a relative, someone you care, care for. You're like, if, they could just, if I could just get them to come through the door. I know God could change your life, but they're very resistant. I understand that. This is why I love our At The Movie series, because I've never heard of anyone who's movie theater resistant. I haven't heard one person like that. I don't know anyone who's resistant to a good movie. No one's offended by a movie, right? So a good strategy is to combine some movies with some biblical teaching. And so Acts chapter two, God does this. God shows us good strategy. Now God does a miracle in Acts chapter two. This is Pentecost where he shows up with tongues of fire, rests on everyone and he speaks with those tongues in everyone's language and delivers the gospel and thousands are saved. It's amazing. But we forget before there was a miracle, there was a strategy. And oftentimes we're praying for a miracle and God says, if you'll add strategy on your side then I'll add a miracle on my side. Amen. So what happens before this? God doesn't just show up. He shows up at Pentecost. What's Pentecost? That's a festival. That's like a world festival, okay? Which means there are people from all walks of life who are actually there. There would have been no need for these tongues of fire to speak in other languages if there weren't people from all around the world. 
So God chose the timing and the location before he did the miracle. Look what it says in Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And so then God does this great miracle. But before that, there was Pentecost. So what we want to do is add our strategy and then ask God to add his miracles. Here's our strategy. I've never met anyone who's resistant to a movie. I know a lot of friends and family that are resistant to church, but I've never met someone resistant to a movie. Here's what I mean. You ever watched a good movie and you went and told your friend about it? Man, you got to see the new Top Gun. It's awesome, right? Or you told your friend about the new, you know, man, you're not going to believe the new Thor movie. It's awesome. Or whatever your favorite movie is. When you tell your friend, I bet no one ever said, don't push your movie on me. That's offensive. <laughs> People don't say that, do they? Right? And so they're fine with that. So this is why I would encourage you to say, hey, I want you to come to church with me this week because we're watching a movie. You're going to love this series. And I bet they're going to be like, uh, uh, what? See, before they get their no out, you got to get the movie part in. They're like, wait, what? You know, yeah, it's really cool. We're decorating the whole theme. It's really cool. Like there's like, like at all the different campuses and then whatever your theme is, our campus pastors tell you about what, what theme you have at yours. Tell, t- tell your friends and then have their kids come because kids love it when they walk in the atrium and this whole theme going on. It's really fun. And so I want to encourage you to make sure that you tell them that. You're going to love it. It's great. There's popcorn. We got candy and food. We all come in and we watch a movie together and learn something from it. It's really, really powerful. Here's what I love about this. You know what's great about movie theaters? It's the one place that people in America still show their emotion, that they let their guard down to have an emotional experience. And so when people come to churches tend to cross their arms. This is why our buildings look more like movie theaters. This is why oftentimes the auditoriums are painted black. It's not because we worship Satan. We don't worship Satan. It's amazing what people say when they see a black auditorium. That's because movie theaters look like this. People are comfortable. Plus, the, the black draws your attention to the stage where there is color, right? And so, but we blacken everything out so it focuses you on to the front. And so, a lot of times, our, our, our seats look like theater seats. Why? It's because we're, we're trying to bring people who don't come to church into an environment that they are used to. Amen. And then they can experience God in a fresh, new way. This is a great church-resistant invite opportunity. Yeah. For someone you have that doesn't normally come to church, I bet they go see movies. So I want to challenge you to overcome the resistance with that person through strategy and invite them to join you this weekend to church. And so this leads me to our last point. Before I say this, I want to tell you something. I love books on effectiveness. I read all kinds of stuff. And some of my favorite books are by a guy named Richard Koch. Richard Koch wrote several with Koch. It's C-O-C-H, K-O-C-H, but it's Koch. But he wrote multiple books called The 80-20 Principle and The 80-20 Rule. The 80-20 principle is, is a, a, from an economist in the 1800s named Vilfredo Pareto. Not burrito. That's a whole other thing. I'm into that too. But the Pareto principle is this, the 80-20 rule. This is what they discovered. They discovered that 80% of your results come from 20% of your efforts. Okay? And so a, a, a better way of saying that is that you can, if you, if you figure out what the a few things you do that really work in your life, do more of that and you'll get greater results. And so what this means, by the way, is that did you know that 80% of our taxes in our country are paid for by 20% of the people? Did you know that? Did you know that 80% of the sales in your company are actually uh, happen from 20% of the sales force? And so 80% of your productivity in your life comes from 20% of your inputs, give you 80% of your outputs. Did you know that? And so if you can figure out what those one or two things that you can do that would make the biggest change in your life, Just do those things. And so right now, I'm going to give you two challenges. The first is to take action. Jesus always said this at the end of his messages. He said, go and do likewise. So we're supposed to do something. So the first thing I want to challenge you to do is a personal action step. What is one thing you can do that will multiply your life? Just think about that for a second. Maybe for you, it's, it's to just, instead of trying to figure out the perfect exercise plan, just, just make a coup and say, I just, every day I'm going to just show up at the gym. I had to figure out what I'm going to do. Just, just walk to the door. That one move is 80% of it right there, right? Maybe for you, it's like I just every day, I'm just going to open the Bible and read one verse at least. By the way, if you're intimidated by the Bible, if you open the Bible about halfway through, you'll find Psalms or Proverbs. I love Proverbs because there's 31 of them. So I'll just look at today's date. Oh, what's today? Today's the 10th, and I'll just read Proverbs 10. And it's so simple. Anyone can make sense of it. And so when you begin to read it, two, three verses in, you'll be like, oh, that really spoke to me. It doesn't even take that many verses. Sometimes I'm so busy, I just open up real quick and, like, and I'll say this out loud, God, I don't have a lot of time, but Lord, I just need one word from you. Yeah. And I'll open it and bam, there's that one word is so powerful. I'm like, God, my kids are driving me crazy. I need one word, thou shalt not kill. Thank you, God. <laughs> I needed that today. 
If you don't have children, you won't get that. But if you have kids, I know you're with me. But I want to encourage you. Sometimes God just has that one verse, doesn't he? And that's just what you needed to hear. And so I want to encourage you to don't judge me. Don't judge me. I'll come to your house sometime. I'll see what's going on. I want to encourage you sometimes one word. And so maybe if you just, just open the Bible every day, just, just one verse and just let that one verse, you'll get 80% results if you just do that one thing. What's one thing that God's telling you to do? Maybe if you just, just show up at church, just turn on online every Sunday morning and, and just go to the Word. Maybe if you just say, I'm going to get in the Word before I get into social media. Whoa, that would change your life. So I'm going to read from God before I read from anyone else's opinion. Just imagine how much that would change your life. Right? What's one thing God's telling you to do? That's your personal thing. Now, corporately, let's all together do one thing. What would happen if we all agreed to do one simple thing? Now, I want to show you what the simple thing can be. See, we want to reach people for Christ. We feel called by God to reach our cities for Christ, our communities, right? But I want to show you some stats real quick in case you didn't know that there was a study done by the Institute of American Church Growth. And this is what they found. They, they, they interviewed 10,000 people about their personal walk with Christ, like what brought them to God and to the church. And here's what they found out. 2% were walk-ins. They just, I'm, I'm sorry, 2% were special needs. They had a situation. They needed to hear from God. They just walked in the door, right? 3% were walk-ins. They just randomly like, oh, I'll try it, right? And so only 6% people come to church because of the preacher. That is a very depressing stat for me, by the way. <laughs> only 1% come from official visitation. Like maybe your church has a visitation program where you go out and you visit people to give, you know, only 1%. Uh, 5% come from Sunday school or children's programs. 5%. And so, that, 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 again, very low. Evangelist of the Crusade, like Billy Cram or Joel Osteen, you know, comes to town. 5% will go to church because of being changed at this program and then going to church after that. 3% from a special program that the church offers. But here it is. 79% of people come to church because a friend or family member brought them. Wow. That means you are the greatest impact. You simply bringing someone with you. Now, don't just invite them. Bring Because you can invite them and they just say no. So, you know, I'm going to come pick you up Sunday morning. Be ready. I'm going to drive up, pick you up, and take you to church. And then afterwards, take them to lunch. Don't be cheap. You buy, you buy lunch, all right? <laughs> don't be cheap, all right? Just whatever you want from the McDonald's menu, I'll got you covered. <laughs> I want to encourage you to pick them up. Bring them to church, bring their kids. I'm, I'm telling you, it, it's powerful. And you say, but I, when I invite them, they, they always ask me all these questions I don't know the answers to. Here's what we're gonna practice. I know this is complicated for a lot of people, so let me just help you right now. We're gonna practice inviting someone right now. Turn to your neighbor right now and go, hey. Let me try it again. It's a big introduction, ready? Say, hey. And say, wanna go to church with me? I know that's complicated. Let me break it down for you. Hey. Wanna go to church with me? I know it's complicated. So I try to say it slow so you get it. Now, when they say, well, I don't know about this scientific question, I don't know about church and this and that and blah, blah, and they have all these reasons, you just go like this, you go, huh? Wanna go to church with me? <laughs> See, we think we have to have all these answers and we don't. Because what is that? That's their defense, that's their excuse. And we all know everyone has a what? A good reason. So blow right through that and say, yeah, I hear you. Do you want to go to church with me? Can we do that? Yeah. Turn your neighbor right now and say, hey, want to go to church with me? See how easy that was? <laughs> Did you know the Bible, Jesus actually said, he said this. He said, pray for the harvest, for the workers of the harvest. He doesn't say pray that people get saved. He says, pray for people to ask them. Pray for workers of the harvest. He doesn't say pray for the salvation. Do you know why? Because Jesus knows something we don't know. He knows that there are more people willing to come to church with you than you're willing to invite. That's good. There are more people willing to accept Christ than you're willing to witness to. Yeah. So the issue is not whether people want to know Jesus. The issue is will we get off our butts and get off our excuses and do our part and bring someone to church with us. That's our part. So right now, I want to ask you to bow your heads all across our churches right now, different campuses, those you're watching online. I want to challenge you. What's your personal action step this week? What's the one thing that you can go straight up 80-20 on? What's one, if I just do this one thing, I'll get 80% results from that. What is it? Write that down. What's God telling you to do to begin doing in your life?
And then the second thing is together as a church, what's the one thing we could all do that'll give us a 79% result? If we just all bring someone to a movie, I mean, that's not a hard sell at all. You're inviting him to a movie. By the way, next week's movie was the movie of the year last year. It was the most awarded movie last year. So I know it's good. People freaked out over it. All the critics went nuts. Bring someone next week and watch God do what only he can do. We do our strategy, then God shows up and does his Pentecost miracle. But we have to do our part first. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, if you will commit spiritually with me to bringing someone, would you lift your hand high? See, Pastor, I can do that. And this is the one week to do it. This is the one opportunity. Just lift your hand high. Thank you. This whole month is a great opportunity, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Just bring someone. It's simple. It's not complicated. Praise God. Praise God. When you see a good movie, you tell your friends. Well, invite them. Bring them. Share it with them. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, maybe your one move this week personally is a real challenge, but set aside your excuses. I know we all have good reasons. We had to set that aside. If God's speaking specifically to you about doing something this week personally, would you lift your hand high? Would you commit it to God? Say, God, I'm going to do it. I've been putting it off. I'm putting it off. I've been making excuses. I'm going to do it. Thank you, God. You're speaking to me now. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you. You can put your hands down. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you've never given your life to Christ, the one thing Jesus did to change everything, and he did a lot of great things. I mean, he walked on water. He healed the blind man. He, he fed 5,000. We could go on and on about the miracles, but the one thing he did that changed everything was when he died on the cross for your sins and for mine. And then he rose again from the grave, proving that he's God. Now he waits for you to accept him in your life. If you will do that, it will change your life forever. You can pray this simple prayer with us today. We're going to say it out loud together across all of our different churches. Those of you watching online, you can pray this prayer today. Just say this with me. Just say, dear Jesus, I realize I need you. I believe you died for my sin. And I believe you rose again. I ask you to come into my heart, be my Lord, and be my Savior. I repent of my sins. I put you in first place. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, if you just gave your life to Christ, no one's looking around. If you just gave your life to Christ, will you just lift your hand high right now? No one's looking around. Just lift your hand high if you just prayed that prayer. You're not alone. Many people just gave their life to Christ. Just hold your hand high. Praise God. We see those hands. Thank you. All the way in the back. Thank you. Thank you, Rodfield. Praise God. Just hold your hand high. Thank you, Stone Oak. Thank you. Praise God. Thank you. Right there in the front at Rockport. Thank you. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you, Padre Island. Hold your hand high just gave your life to Christ. Those of you who are online with us, you can put in the text chat. Just text my hand raised. Just let us know or click hand raised if you're, church, if you're at churchunlimited.online. Praise God. Thank you for the decision you made to give your life to Christ. You will never, ever regret that decision. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for those who just gave their life to you. And thank you, God, that we've committed to you a personal action step but Lord, we've also committed to you a corporate action step. As a church, as a people, we will bring someone next week to at the movies. And we pray, God, that we'll use this strategy and we ask you to do your miracle on top of it. Thank you for what you're going to do through at the movies. In your name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Isn't God good? His word is so true. Thank you for watching the Church Unlimited YouTube channel. But don't stop now. Join our online family so you can stay connected with what God is doing here. Subscribe to this channel and hit the bell so that you never miss a service and don't forget to share with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give Now button to help us continue to impact lives around the world. Thank you for watching and God bless.